Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about the Pacific Theater of World War II, and more specifically the latter half of it. The Pacific War as a whole is basically a tale of two halves. The Imperial Japanese dramatically expanding their territory and pushing Allied forces far from mainland Japan in the first half, then Allied forces slowly but surely pushing Japanese forces back into mainland Japan in the second half. Among a great many factors of why this shift occurred, the one we'll be focusing on is the shift in air power and aircraft quality. Early in the war, the Japanese Zero was a very feared aircraft that had a kill-death ratio upwards of 12 to 1. This iconic plane would sacrifice armor for speed, maneuverability, and range, which, while making the plane fragile, also made it incredibly deadly in a one-on-one -on -one fight in the hands of an experienced pilot. For the first few years of the Pacific War, the Zero would rule as king. However, as the war progressed, Allied pilots began adapting to the Zero's stunning agility and Allied aircraft technology would end up advancing well past what the Zero could offer. Pilots quickly realized that in a one-on-one -on -one fight, the Zero's agility gave it a clear advantage, so several maneuvers and tactics were developed to help counter it. Because of the Zero's complete lack of armor, a high-altitude ambush tactic was used. Allied planes, when a Zero was spotted by men on the ground and or by radar, would climb to higher altitudes before diving down towards the enemy aircraft. Then they fired a small burst that, because of the Zero's poor armor, would often be enough to down it, before they then retreated back to higher altitudes. They would also employ a maneuver known as the Thatch Weave. This maneuver required at least two Allied aircraft. When a Zero targeted one of them, the two or more aircraft would fly towards each other and would intersect. When the enemy Zero would follow, this would put it directly in the firing line of the other Allied plane, who then could shoot down the Zero. Tactics and maneuvers like these helped level the playing field when Allied aircraft on their own simply weren't at the level of the Zero. Then there was the advancement of Allied technology. In the first year of the war, planes like the F-4F Wildcat, while not necessarily bad in their own right, were quite inferior to the Zero, and American pilots were incredibly dissatisfied with how their planes performed in combat. This dissatisfaction is what led to maneuvers and tactics that helped level things out, but in late 1942 and early 1943, planes like the F-6F Hellcat and the F-4U Corsair began appearing in the U.S. arsenal. These planes could match, for the most part, the agility of the Zero, while also being faster and having better armor. The Zero could still match up against them in the hands of a skilled pilot, but as we'll get to later as the war progressed, that became more and more difficult. Now, just before Allied forces introduced planes like the Hellcat and the Corsair, Japan began testing a new fighter aircraft, a modified version of a different plane that when it finally saw combat, gave the best Allied aircraft a good run for their money. This is what was likely the best fighter in the Japanese arsenal, and possibly one of the best fighter planes of the Pacific War. This is the Kawanishi N1KJ. For the remainder of this video, and for the sake of ease, we'll be calling the N1KJ aircraft by their Allied reporting names. It's easier to say, and it's also kind of more funny. Anyway, though, the story of the N1K1J, the George, begins with a Japanese float plane simply called the N1K, or Rex. The Rex was originally designed as a single-engine float plane that would also serve as a fighter. A float plane specifically was sought in an effort to further the Japanese advance through the Pacific, 
in areas where neither carriers nor land-based aircraft were viable, basically for use in island chains where Japanese airfields didn't exist. This plane would first fly in May 1942, just before the Pacific War began turning against the Japanese. By the time it was introduced to the Japanese Navy in 1943, the war situation had shifted, American aircraft had started to improve greatly, and a fighter hampered by such a bulky pontoon simply wasn't viable now and the design would largely be abandoned, seeing a total production run of just 97 throughout the war. Luckily for the Japanese military, the company Kawanishi saw great promise in its airframe and elected to privately test it as a land-based fighter. In addition to removing the bulky pontoon and installing some wheels, there would also be an upgrade in its engine. Out went the original Mitsubishi MK4C Kase engine with around 1,400 horsepower, and in went the Nakajima NK9H Homare engine, with around 2,000 horsepower. To better fit the more powerful engine, a larger propeller was also fitted. However, the Rex's mid-mounted wings necessitated a slapdash lengthening in the landing gear as a result of the larger propeller. Still though, this reduction in weight and general bulk from removing the pontoon combined with the increase in power, would increase the top speed of the Rex by 51 miles an hour, from 304 to 355. Combine this speed with four 20mm cannons in the wings, the plane as it stood here was faster and stronger than the Zero, while also having solid agility and better armor. The first prototype, now referred to as the George here, would fly on December 27, 1942, to mixed but promising results. The flight testing confirmed the greater speed of the George and overall solid flight characteristics, but there were some issues with the engine and the landing gear. Its engine had been rushed into production and was thus prone to issues, while the landing gear was prone to failing due to poor heat treatment of the wheels. The wheels will get hot, after all. Still though, the actual flight characteristics were so promising that the George design was ordered into production, receiving the designation of N1K1J, full name Kawanishi N1K1J Shiden. Immediately after that first test flight, either on December 31st or January 1st, 1943, Kawanishi embarked on creating an upgraded version that was significantly redesigned. The wings would be moved from a mid-mount to a low-mount, allowing them to use a more conventional shorter landing gear. The fuselage would also be lengthened and the tail would be redesigned as well. The general production process would be simplified and a whopping 550 pounds of excess weight would be removed the engine and the armament would remain the same. This new design would have the full name of Kawanishi M1K2J Shiden Kai. This model was also called the George by Allied forces, but to help differentiate it from the N1K1, I'll be calling it the Kai. While these upgrades and alterations to the Kai were significant, the wing alteration helped fix the landing gear issue. The most significant change in the design may have been the smallest. One of these little guys was added to the aircraft's gauge system. This simple addition was a mercury switch. Now, before I continue, I should mention that some sources and websites make it sound as if this little switch was on the Rex and the George, but the National Air and Space Museum says that this switch was unique to the Kai, so I'll take their word for it. Anyway, this kind of switch activates when the mercury metal in the glass tube connects the two electrodes, completing the circuit. In the case of the Kai, what this switch did was it was set to trigger when there was a change in g-force and airspeed. When that change was detected and the circuit was then complete, 
the system automatically deployed combat wing flaps that, depending on the force and airspeed, were angled up to 30 degrees. These flaps would help generate lift and lower the plane's stall speed. What this would mean in practice is that on sharp turns, these flaps would trigger and allow the plane to take even tighter turns. Once the pilot stopped turning and the g-forces decreased, the flaps would automatically retract back to normal. Combine this boost in turning agility with the fact that the Kai already had a very high roll rate at 82 degrees per second at 240 miles an hour, this would make the Kai an astonishingly agile aircraft. Because of this sheer agility, the fact that its top speed of around 370 miles an hour was below that of the Hellcat and Corsair didn't matter all that much. Still though, the fact that the Kai was a full redesign meant that it wouldn't be appearing on the battlefield until much later. Meanwhile, the George began rolling off the production line in small quantities in mid-1943, with about 10 models being produced for testing from July to August. After that, the production of the George would generally follow a bell curve from September 1943 to June 1945, with the peak occurring in September 1944 with 106 models produced. In that span, a grand total of 1,007 Georges would be constructed, which sounds like a lot until you consider the fact that during the same span, well over 5,000 of the comparatively outdated Zeros were also constructed. The Kai would be produced in even fewer numbers due to its redesign, and from December 1943 to August 1945, 406 Kai models were produced. With the total number of N1Ks in existence, including the Rex float planes being around 1,500, and with them only entering combat sometime in 1944, they would have a very limited chance to make an impact, but American pilots did indeed notice them. The George would prove itself to be a formidable foe to even the best aircraft America had to offer, but due to the limited number being produced every month, planes like the George and the Kai were generally only given to the very best pilots Japan had. Plus, with the incredible agility and increased power they offered, the planes really needed skilled pilots to fly them the less skilled pilots would generally be given other aircraft like the Zero. For example, a late-war Japanese fighter group called the 343rd Kokutai were outfitted with both Georges and Kais, along with some Zeros. The combat results of such groups, at least when compared to more novice groups flying more inferior aircraft, were quite impressive, and generally speaking, the groups outfitted with the Georges and Kais could go tit-for-tat, blow-for-blow with American groups. According to a bit of a Japanese legend, in February 1945, ace pilot Kaneyoshi Muto, all alone and flying a Kai, came up against 12 American Hellcats. Seemingly faced with certain death, Muto would manage to fight off all 12 Hellcats by himself, shooting down four of them in the process. Now, this would be quite the story if it were actually true. In reality, the story was a propaganda piece, but with a small hint of truth. The real story is that Muto and at least nine other pilots came across a formation of American Hellcats, seven strong. Muto and co. would manage to take down four Hellcats with no losses to themselves before the remaining three Hellcats would retreat. Now, this was just a single event that was a pretty clear win for the Japanese pilots, but other events were more even-handed, with both sides trading blows and losses. For an example of this, we can look at a battle in the skies of Kure, a city in Hiroshima, on March 19, 1945. 
In this battle, a U.S. force some 300 strong, consisting roughly half of dive and torpedo bombers and the other half of Hellcats and Corsairs, came up against the remnants of the Japanese combined fleet, which included several large battleships and carriers and the 343rd Kokutai, with total air forces measuring roughly 300 strong as well. The overall battle would be a loss for Allied forces, where they would damage several Japanese ships but sink none, while suffering over 800 dead due to the USS Franklin being severely damaged by the Japanese. For our purposes with the N1K planes, the air battles between the Allied Corsairs and Hellcats and the Japanese Georges and Kais proved to be basically even. Losses were pretty low for both sides, all things considered, but still basically even. Allied forces would lose 14 fighters and 8 pilots in combat. Not all 14 planes were shot down out of the sky, mind you, and several would manage to return back to their ships, but they were so badly damaged that they were just tossed overboard from their respective carriers. Allied forces also lost 13 of their dive and torpedo bombers in the process. Japan's 343rd unit would lose 15 fighters, all N1Ks, and 13 pilots, along with the loss of a three-man reconnaissance aircraft and nine other pilots presumably flying Zeros. In the aftermath of the battle, some of the American pilots that were captured by the Japanese would remark on the surprising quality of the Japanese aircraft and pilots they encountered, saying, in essence, that they believed that the Japanese forces at that point were incredibly poorly coordinated and had poor aircraft. So coming across the 343rd and their N1K planes came as an incredible shock to see such proficient aircraft and skilled pilots at that stage of the war. There are several other battles and events I could recap here, but for the sake of brevity, I'll link down in the description a book on the 343rd and their battles, if you are interested in reading more. To summarize though, planes like the George and the Kai ended up faring remarkably well against late war American fighters where the Zero was now outclassed, the N1K shined. Still though, this raises the question of why, comparatively, so few George and Kai planes were made. Why was the bulk of Japanese production focused on the blatantly inferior Zero? To answer this question, we have to understand the state of the war, Japan, and its air force. As you may have inferred from the Kure battle, the war had progressed to the point where Allied forces were flying over the Japanese mainland, and they were attacking Japanese ports, factories, infrastructure, etc. In these attacks on Japanese mainland forces, coupled with things like the firebombing of Japanese cities, Japan was losing a great deal of materiel and, more critically, production facilities. The crippling of Japan's factories inherently limited how many aircraft they could pump out to try and defend the mainland. Still though, if their facilities were limited and damaged, why not produce the N1K planes instead of the Zeros? That was because, between the two, the Zero was far easier to produce. While the Kai version of the N1K had been simplified, any N1K plane was more complex and more difficult to produce than your average Zero. I mean, the Zero basically didn't have any armor to it. It was like a frame with guns on it. It was much easier to make one of those than a plane with bigger guns, armor, and that unique Mercury Switch system. Still though, even if we have a hypothetical scenario of the N1K being easier to produce, I do still think it's likely that they may still have focused on producing the Zero, due to the fact that the Zero was regarded as being easier to fly. As previously stated, the Kai, with its unique combat flap system, and the George more broadly, were more demanding planes and required much more experience to properly control. 
At this point in the war, Japan severely lacked experienced pilots. They had been losing a great deal of their experienced airmen through the second half of the war, and due to their dire situation, they really didn't have the time to extensively train pilots and give them the experience necessary to fly more complex aircraft. The sheer lack of experienced pilots is partly the reason why Japanese aviation tactics shifted over to using kamikazes. You didn't need an experienced pilot to crash a plane. Any idiot could do that, even me. You don't need any experience to do something wrong. So, even if Japan had the production capacity to make the N1Ks en masse, they didn't have the experienced pilots needed to fly them. Even if we reverse both of these factors, in Japan having the production capabilities to make the N1K at numbers to replace zero production, and having the pilots necessary to fly them, in this new scenario where the N1K is now the primary plane for the Japanese Air Force, I don't think it would have made much of a difference. Not this late in the war. The sheer numbers just weren't there. If we assume that all zeros were replaced with N1K aircraft, Japan would have over 6,000 Kais and Georges at their disposal. This, compared to a collective over 14,000 Hellcats and Corsairs that the United States would produce during the war. At this point, America just had too great a numerical advantage. The quality of the N1K planes wouldn't and didn't matter all that much. Whatever planes America lost, they could replace just as easily. But still, even though the Kai and the George appeared too late on the scene to make any kind of meaningful impact, that doesn't diminish how effective they were on an individual level. The fact that they were giving the best planes America had a run for their money is a testament to their quality and the quality of the pilots that flew them. Even though they're relatively forgotten about in favor of the Zero, the N1K Kai and George should be remembered when thinking of the best fighter planes of the Second World War. Alright, and with that we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I really do love the fact that the plane was just called George. It just sounds so bizarre. Imagine that you're a U.S. soldier at the time, and you hear that there are a bunch of Georges overhead. Is that supposed to be an insult? Are they just being funny? Maybe George Costanza's up there. Anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!